One of the most striking things about the solar system is that there are huge differences between the atmospheres of each of the planets. And it's not just fundamental differences such as the atmosphere of Jupiter when compared to Earth, but also with the terrestrial planets as well. For example, as far as percentages go rather than actual amounts of gas, did you know that Earth is actually not the most oxygen-rich planetary atmosphere in the inner solar system? That distinction actually belongs to Mercury. While Mercury's atmosphere is tenuous at best, barely existent really, it is made up of 42% oxygen, and it has an unusually large amount of helium, 8% due to its proximity to the Sun. And it's got 22% sodium, odd planet indeed, and not really very much like anything else in the solar system. But remember, that atmosphere is more of a trace than a real atmosphere. Then there are Venus and Mars. These are carbon dioxide planets. Venus is at 96% carbon dioxide and Mars at 95. But they are at very different pressures, Venus very high, crushingly so, and Mars very low. This is in drastic contrast to Earth, which has very low amounts of carbon dioxide, but a massive amount of nitrogen and oxygen. Mars and Venus have some nitrogen as well, 4 and 2.7% respectively. But why does Earth have so much nitrogen? Well, this comes down to some specific features of nitrogen and its compounds. It's a volatile in most of its forms, so it likes being a gas at low temperature. It also doesn't really like to react with the materials that make up the Earth's surface, meaning that it doesn't get locked up in geology like highly reactive oxygen does, and also carbon dioxide. The last thing that favors it is that it doesn't get broken up by the sun's radiation here on Earth. But interestingly, nitrogen isn't completely useless, and it's a major thing in agriculture to fix nitrogen in the soil as fertilizer. But in some cases, nature has already figured out how to do this. Outside of astronomy, one of my big interests is gardening. And there actually are plants that can take atmospheric nitrogen and fertilize itself by way of a billions of year old symbiotic relationship with bacteria that can work with nitrogen. Sometimes the bacteria is literally present in the seed itself, so it can colonize the soil around the plant and then both then thrive. One example of this is the green bean, or indeed all members of the faceless family. One wonders what possibilities symbiotic relationships offer between different forms of life on an exoplanet. But why doesn't Mars or Venus also have much more significant amounts of nitrogen? Well, Venus has plenty of nitrogen, actually more than Earth. It's just that the atmosphere is far denser and it has a lot more carbon dioxide. The reason for this is because Earth can essentially process CO2 through the carbon cycle, subduct it under the surface of the planet, lock it up in oceans, and, well, life, and so on. Venus doesn't have any of this, so the atmosphere on that planet is where all the carbon goes. Nitrogen on Mars is a different story. Here the nitrogen is missing, assuming that Mars got a supply of the element like Earth and Venus did. One way Mars can lose nitrogen is loss into space, and it lost most of its original atmosphere. The other way is chemical. Nitrogen can get locked into nitrates in the Martian soil, as well as other processes. Essentially, the chemistry and the atmospheric loss robbed Mars of most of its nitrogen long ago. The differences between the terrestrial planets and the solar system show how different atmospheric circumstances can be in star systems between member planets. No doubt we'll find much more variation in exoplanets when our instrumentation allows more thorough characterization of exoplanet atmospheres, particularly the long-awaited James Webb Space Telescope. It will be interesting also to not only look for analogs of Earth, but also exoplanets similar to Venus and Mars. That's assuming that star systems similar to ours are common. But what if they're not? There are actually some early indications that our solar system actually isn't the norm. It actually may end up being very rare as a configuration and bear implications on the possibility of life and eventually civilizations. And that's a bit spooky, but also a potential solution to the Fermi paradox that star systems where life can develop are exceedingly rare, thus explaining the great silence. But the assumption within science has always been that Earth should be nothing special, and that we occupy no particularly special location in the universe. And that thinking has served science well. As late as the 1990s, the existence of exoplanets had not been confirmed. But by then, almost all astronomers were of the opinion that there was simply no reason why planets should be rare. As it turns out, they're not. 
we now know of several thousand exoplanets and the tally grows each year. But so far, nothing quite like the solar system has been identified. In fact, it seems to be the opposite, where multiple planet systems tend toward a pattern of similar sized worlds at regular spacing. Our solar system generally obeys the spacing part, at least the inner solar system, but not the regular planetary sizes. It may once have to a degree, but the violent impacts and the factors that shaped our solar system may have been different from that of other exoplanet systems. Why this system would be different and how rare it actually is remains to be seen. But the study of the atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets also promises another possibility, that of technosignatures such as CFCs and nitrogen dioxide that might point to an industrial civilization present on that planet, or strange oxygen and methane levels that might indicate life, such as the biosignature that Earth itself has broadcasted to the rest of the galaxy's scientists for billions of years. But what of types of terrestrial exoplanet atmospheres for which we have no example in our own solar system? While the study of exoplanet atmospheres is in its infancy, we should gain new insights into them with coming instruments like the James Webb Space Telescope. Still, some work has been done in exoplanet atmospheres, particularly giant planets. But with terrestrial small worlds like Earth, not a great deal is yet known. But there has been some modeling. But the problem here is that planetary atmospheres evolve. Earth, for example, once had significant hydrogen in its atmosphere. It no longer does, in part because Earth simply can't hold on to hydrogen. But other types of stars, such as M-type dwarf stars, may be capable of dramatically altering or blowing away entirely an exoplanet's atmosphere, in which case it might actually form a second atmosphere entirely. And there is a suspect for this. The planet is designated GJ 1132b, and it orbits a red dwarf. It's cool enough for an atmosphere, and is only about 40 light years from Earth, which makes it easier to study. It's about 20% larger than Earth, but is suspected to be terrestrial in nature. But it's hot, receiving 19 times more solar energy than Earth does due to close proximity to its parent star, and it's very probably tidally locked. Earth analog, this is not. This is also an unusual planet in that it probably doesn't have much topography, rather a relatively smooth surface with a thin crust then becoming fully molten not far below. And it has an atmosphere, but it's nothing like ours, consisting of hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen cyanide. Think of a probably hazy, hotter than Venus hellscape dotted with exposures of molten lava and burnt solid crust, not unlike freshly solidified lava here on Earth. But this planet probably should have no atmosphere at all. The red dwarf it orbits should have stripped off any atmosphere it had early on, meaning that this may actually be the planet's second atmosphere, generated by geologic processes going on within it. It may have originally started as a planet with a large, gaseous atmosphere. Essentially, it's the core of a sub-Neptune. But more recent work has cast doubt on this detection. It may have no atmosphere after all which underscores that we really are just beginning the study of exoplanet atmospheres. And there are many other possibilities. What of a world so hot that it has clouds of vaporized rock? Or hot Jupiters so hot and so close to their stars that water itself breaks down, leaving them with very dry atmospheres, whereas planets just a little cooler typically have water vapor? Or how about an oxygen-rich world where the oxygen is not being produced by life as it is here, but by geophysical processes. And it's worth noting that given the study of other atmospheres outside of the solar system is fairly new, especially with terrestrial worlds, the actual nuances of these atmospheres isn't yet known. It's extremely difficult to model Earth's atmosphere, for example, and we have no shortage of data on it. Modeling an exoplanet accurately will be limited to the basics of these worlds, at least until someone goes and visits them. But what of our own atmosphere? Being essentially the holy grail of terrestrial worlds, what will become of Earth's atmosphere? There are several possibilities. If left to its own devices, the atmosphere of Earth will suffer at the hands of the Sun. As the Sun's luminosity increases as it ages, Earth will become a place where surface life is no longer possible, and the oceans will simply evaporate, blanketing the world in water vapor, itself a greenhouse gas, creating what's known as a moist greenhouse planet. And then it runs away with itself as the greenhouse effect grows increasingly worse until eventually the surface of the Earth melts, which if it hadn't happened already, all life on this planet will cease. 
and the planet itself will probably end with being engulfed by another type of atmosphere entirely, that of the sun as it swells into its red giant phase. Or maybe not. Earth's atmospheric clemency could be extended in principle through terraforming our own world. There are things we can do, if we're still around, to stave off, at least for a time, the effects of the brightening sun. One simple method of doing this is a starshade, where a small, but over time, increasing percentage of the sun's light is blocked out from a shade in space, thus mitigating the effects of the aging sun. And there are other changes to other planets in this regard as well. Both Venus and Mars are in principle terraformable, and by that time might be viable inhabited terraformed worlds. We certainly have the time to do that on the order of hundreds of millions of years into the human future. And while all of this happens, the sun's natural habitable zone moves outward, opening up possibilities to terraform and settle moons further out in the solar system. And moons can hold their own atmospheres, even substantially as Titan shows. So who knows what the future of planetary atmospheres in our solar system is going to be like. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about alien first contact with all this talk about UAPs lately. Yes, I'm finally going to weigh in on that topic sometime soon. But what if they show up abruptly and say boo, causing the entire population of humans to simultaneously jump? That certainly would not bode well for future relations with the aliens. Or think about the alien equivalent of a whoopee cushion. Or what are them stealing and hiding an entire moon from us? Aliens? Where's Oberon? Not good, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.